Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is great to see everybody here. I am Chris Paxson, President of Brown, and this is just a very special event and a great way to open our new academic year. Uh, we have Brown students and faculty and staff and alumni and parents and community members, and you are all very welcome. Today, we are honored to have Brown's distinguished President Emerita Ruth Simmons here to discuss her new memoir, Up Home, One Girl's Journey. And for those of you who haven't read the book yet, and it did just come out, it tells the story of Ruth's childhood as the daughter of sharecroppers in East Texas up until her college graduation. And we'll explore that story in more depth later. Uh, but first, I want to formally introduce her. And she doesn't, she could have a long introduction, but I think she's well enough known here that I'm not going to give her a really long introduction. So as all of you probably know, Ruth Simmons is a scholar. She is a pioneering academic administrator. She's a change maker in higher education. She is the former president of Smith College, Prairie View A&M University, which is Texas's oldest HBCU, and of course, Brown University, where she advanced the university standing. Yes. And I'm grateful for the work she did in setting Brown on a trajectory in, as you know, excellence in research and education and everything that we stand for. It's because of President Simmons' leadership, especially her charge to, quote, tell the truth in all its complexity and confront the university's historical relationship to slavery that we have the newly renamed Ruth J. Simmons Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. many honors over the course of her career, but I'll just name what I think is probably one of the most recent, if not the most. Uh, she was selected this year to give the Jefferson Lecture in the Humanities, which is the highest honor bestowed by the federal government for distinguished achievement in uh, the intellectual advancement of the humanities. So that's something really, really special, and I'm looking forward to hearing that lecture. Simmons holds a bachelor's degree in French from Dillard University, a master's and doctorate from Harvard University in Romance Languages and Literature. Please join me in welcoming Ruth Simmons. Welcome. Welcome back to Brown. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Uh, as I said before, you know, your memoir, it came out, what, just a, a couple days ago, literally? Yes. Yeah. And I was very privileged to get an advanced copy, which I needed to prepare for this day. Uh, I read it in a single day because it was incredibly compelling. For, so for those of you, get it, read it. It's fantastic. Uh, and I just want to thank you for agreeing to return home, especially as we celebrate the Ruth J. Simmons Center. And it's, it's renaming and, and all, the, all those great things. Now, just for the audience, I'm going to focus my questions, and we'll start maybe 20, 25 minutes with questions on the book, which I expect everybody hasn't read yet. And then we'll open it up for a broader set of questions from the audience, and those could be about your time at Brown, they could be about current events, requests for advice, anything else. So think of, think of those questions, a anything, anything. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna start with some motivation for writing the book. And you start the book with a remarkable statement about your growing up in East Texas in the 40s and 50s. And you say, I was born to be someone else Someone, that is, whose life is defined principally by race, segregation, and poverty. But then you go on to say that you wrote the book to explain how people and opportunities, mainly educational opportunities, really enabled you to move out of that preordained uh, uh, role that you feel like you, you were, quote, meant to play. 
Is there a reason why you decided to write this book now? Is it like historic? I know that you stepped down from a college presidency, so maybe you have a bit more time. But I assume that there are other reasons why <laughs> a bit, yeah. this was a good time to write this well, book. Well, actually, uh, Chris, I started uh, writing it when I was president at Brown. Really? I did. <clears throat> but um, you, as you know, the presidency of Brown is pretty all-consuming. <laughs> and I realized that I would not have the time to finish it. And so I returned my advance. Um, I don't know if they'd ever received an advance back, but I, I, I sent the money back and said, I just can't do it now. Um, and then I went on and s retired. Okay. Um, when I started at Prairie View, it seemed to me that these young people were very much as I was at their age. And I don't think they understood the possibilities. There's so much bad news that happened while I was at Prairie View um, with the um, George Floyd incident, um, with um, the poisonous environment in our state, um, the um, really uh, revival of so much hatred uh, toward, um, uh, toward different groups in society. Um, and I sensed that they needed to hear something about our having been there before and um, about how it's possible to live through those difficult periods and be stronger um, in part as a consequence of dealing with them. Mm -hmm. And so I took it up again and when the pandemic came along, I had, we were at, at home um, more, and I had time to actually finish it. So that's why it's coming out now, because the pandemic allowed me the time to right. finish it. If you had had the time to finish it when you were at Brown, how different a book is it because of the time in which you wrote it? Going through the pandemic, going through George Floyd, all of the other things that happened. Or maybe it would have been the same, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not altogether sure, because you know as I start the book, uh, I'm really reflecting on how surprised I am at, the, at my age today that um, I have been able to have such an incredibly satisfying life. Um, and I start with a scene where I'm on the stage at Harvard <clears throat> and the president is reading a citation about me. And in my mind, I'm seeing this spectral figure of a young girl, me, wandering about Harvard Yard, feeling out of place and unappreciated. Um, and the prospects for me at that time when I was a graduate student at Harvard didn't look very good because the faculty, in fact, in my department said, there wasn't going to be much that I'd be able to do in this profession because what was a black girl studying French <laughs> supposed to do with that, uh, with a PhD in French? I mean, come on. Um, so trying to persuade me that the thing that I loved most, the thing that I thought defined well uh, who I was and who I wanted to be, was all wrong as they saw it, right? Um, and yet, um, here I was back at Harvard, and Harvard was saying, you've really done well. Okay. Um, well, Harvard would do that, you know. Uh, so yeah, they would. <laughs> so uh, I started writing it at Brown because while at Smith and at Brown, my students constantly asked me questions about my youth. And they did so because when I was named president of Smith, the New York Times did a, an article about me that revealed for the first time for most people uh, that I had been born in certain circumstances that uh, people were unaware of. Mm -hmm. And many people, uh, when they see poverty and exclusion and um, the kind of life that I was born into, believe you're consigned to a certain fate as a consequence of it. And so my students ask me questions like, why aren't you angry, Ruth? Why, why aren't you angry because of the life that you had as a child? Um, or they'd ask me, well, tell me, you know, formulaically, how do you go from there to where you are now? Because I want to chart a path mm -hmm. to leadership. So how do I do that? 
And so I found that people tended to be very uh, <clears throat> simplistic in their thinking about uh, the living of a life, first of all, mm -hmm. a complicated life, uh, the role that education plays for us, the role that the, um, the segregation of groups um, plays in our lives. And I really wanted people to understand the intentional, the intentional um, going beyond those barriers to know people who are different, mm -hmm. to care about people who are different, to reveal who you are and hope that they come to know what is possible in human connections and so forth. I just thought that was something my students needed to know. Yeah. But I also didn't want them to mythologize me because they came to see me as this outsized figure who'd done something heroic. And I wanted to say, not at all. Um, because step by step in the living of my life, I have been open to learning, mm -hmm. open to other people, open to the possibility of doing things differently, open to different opinions and so forth. So I wanted to tell that story about how much I was able to grow just by going beyond the limitations mm -hmm. that um, that segregation imposed on me. Yeah. You, you know, as you went, and the book sort of outlines moves, you know, Daily Texas, then um, uh, what was it called? It was La Texo. La Texo. And then you went to Houston, and then you went to New Orleans for Dillard, and then you, Wellesley, and then Harvard. So there's a series of moves throughout the book. And the intentionality was there, but I, I couldn't help but think about the role of happenstance and luck. I mean, you were born the 12th child. If you had been born the first, things yes. would have been, if your father hadn't moved yes. you to Houston. They, and, and I wonder whether as an educator that, you know, you were luck, fortunate to get opportunities and you wanted to have a role to give opportunities to others. I, I don't know how that factors into your thinking. Well, it's it not did, a very well formulated question. Yeah, it, it didn't until somewhat later because in my, uh, in my early life, I was really following a path created for me by others. Yeah. The most children. wonderful thing is, you know, if you're a child um, of, of extraordinary uh, want, um, the capacity of people to enter onto your path and create an entirely different path for you is phenomenal. I also wanted to write this book for teachers so they understood the role that they played. So I, I talk about my teachers, for example, my first grade teacher, uh, whom I never forgot because she is indelibly a part of who I am because she showed me what learning could be. Uh, it, we didn't have books at home, we didn't have learning utensils or anything of that sort. And so when I walk into my very first classroom and this woman, <clears throat> treated me as if I was not the country bumpkin that I actually was, uh, but someone with immense potential. And she had this quality in her voice that suggested that it was absolutely true, right? Yeah. And, and so she's, oh, baby, you're, oh, that is so wonderful. Imagine what that does when you are the youngest of 12 and everybody in the household thinks you're a burden. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, and so my, my sisters and brothers, oh my God, you know, we did not need another child in this house. Uh, and then I was quite, uh, I was quite difficult uh, and so forth. And, and, and what? I, I was very spoiled as the youngest child mm -hmm. and so forth. And so, uh, and I was different. I was never like um, everybody else. And, and so she was the first person to say, who you are is good. Mm -hmm. You have promise. And that started me on the path of thinking, well, school must be the best thing in the world because um, of that feeling that I got from her. And that was Miss Ida May, Miss right? Ida May. So, so it's funny because I, I was really struck by your description of her. And one thing that you talked about for her and also other teachers was um, how they sparked your love of the power of language. 
and writing, which clearly has become a big part of your life. And you say of her, to be in the presence of a person who spoke so well was a revelation. I wanted to seize control of these words and make them work for me, yes. which I thought was so wonderful. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you were in the rural area, uh, imagine really in the 40s and 50s, um, you had nothing really. Um, and so uh, th th there, was, th there was nothing of pride that, that you could possess mm -hmm. in that era. Um, and so it seemed to me when I started, when I heard her and I started reading, I thought, well, these are things that I can, I can own. Uh, it doesn't matter if I'm poor. Um, uh, uh, but more than that, as I grew older, it occurred to me that they, they had a certain power. Mm -hmm. Because what segregation did in that era is it silenced uh, African Americans. There were certain things you could not say uh, because you could be summarily disciplined or even killed for it. And so we were taught uh, that we could not say certain things. Um, and so we didn't own language in a sense. Uh, we had certain parameters. Mm -hmm. And then when the, when the idea of the power of these words came to me, I thought, well, I can say anything I want. Um, I, can, <laughs> I, can give, I can give voice to how I feel. I can give voice to what I dislike about these circumstances and because you know, you're in a rural area and people are really kind of mumbling and not talking very well, I could speak better than any of them, right? Um, and so, so I practiced. You took some ribbon for that too, right? <laughs> well, yes, I was, I was you know, um, sadiddy. <laughs> <laughs> some of you may not be familiar with that term, uh, sadiddy. Uh, sadiddy in the black community is, uh, is that's someone with their nose in the air who thinks they're better than everybody else. <laughs> and, and by the way, I was called Sadiddy all the way up to graduation from high school. So I, I didn't, I didn't lose, uh, maybe in college too, actually. Uh -huh. um, I didn't lose that. But, but, I, um, but this, this business of expression is so empowering and I that's one of the things I did at Prairie was to create a writing program for my students because to to impart to them the power they will feel when they're actually able to express with pre precision what they think um, and who they are it's it's wonderful and so Mackenzie Scott uh, gave us a gift and when I told her that I was, she is herself a writer, most people don't remember that about her, but, and she gave us $50 million, but um, one of the things that, um, uh, when I, 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 I told her that I was creating this writing program, she cried. Oh. That's, how, that's how important it is for, especially for people who are not, don't feel empowered yeah. uh, to be able to do that for themselves. Yeah. So, so one question, and I only have a few more questions, but this is based on something that a student had pre-submitted. And they hadn't read your book, clearly, but you know, you read the book and you're going from New Orleans to Wellesley, a summer in France. I mean, these amazing experiences and your dedication and resourcefulness getting there was amazing. Uh, but the question is, people talk a lot about imposter syndrome. I hear this from my students and feeling that you don't belong, you don't deserve to be there. Do you, do you feel that, did you feel that way and what advice or reassurance do you, do you give to students who do feel that way? Yeah, well, I, I still have it. Okay. Um, and um, it was difficult for me because as I proceeded, I got so many opportunities, but they were obscenely uh, extravagant opportunities. Um, and so uh, I got a chance to spend my junior year at Wellesley. Um, and as you might imagine, life at Wellesley at that time, having high tea um, and, um, and going on fabulous skiing trips and all of that sort of thing. I couldn't, I couldn't tell my family I was doing that. No. How could I? How could I? Uh, and then going to France and uh, living with a French uh, family 
and riding horseback on the Camargue. I couldn't tell them that. I mean, really, it, um, because uh, I'm already Sadidi. Um, <laughs> and, We've established that, yes. And, and sharing that with them would have been awful. But I especially did not want to create a wall between me and the people I love most. And so, for the longest, I told them nothing of what my experiences were. Mm -hmm. I couldn't. I couldn't bring myself to do that. Um, and it was not really until I think I became president of Smith that this information began to come out. And they are today hearing things uh, that they have never known before about things that I have done. Um, and, um, and that is because they all remained in Houston. And uh, for, for those of you who don't understand the, that, that period, my older sisters and brothers uh, had to work in the fields. Uh, and of course, they couldn't go to school every day. And so they couldn't uh, graduate from, from high school. Um, the fact that we moved away from the small town when I was uh, uh, seven uh, enabled me to go to school every day. Mm -hmm. uh, making all the difference in the world, of course. Yeah. But for all of the, um, the, the senior cohort of my sisters and brothers, they had to get a GED when they were adults because they simply didn't go to school enough. It was much more important to pick cotton and to make money for the, for the farms mm -hmm. um, and so on. So, um, so I felt bad uh, much of the time when I was a student because I, I knew my family's condition I knew they were living uh, close to the poverty line um, when I was doing these wonderful things, and it felt pretty, pretty bad to me, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, you know, I have tried to make up for that in incredible ways in my adult life. Uh, I've, I bought all my sisters and brothers' cars. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've done all, it, it, nothing has helped, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, I, I don't think I'm gonna be able to fill that chasm, uh, but, uh, but, but it, it, it does, it weighs heavily on one. The one thing I would say, I do say to my students, is that when you get an education and when you succeed as a human being, you're lifting everybody in your family. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely true. And so um, if, you, if you persist, you're going to have a way of giving back to them what they have given to you. And, um, and, but otherwise, I think it's awfully hard to tell a human being you shouldn't feel um, bad because you are a lot better off than others, um, you know, than your whole community. Uh, you, should, you shouldn't feel bad because um, you are different and people may not uh, respect you or like you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the one thing I will say to, to students is, don't, there's one path not to take, and that is to pretend to be somebody you are not. Yeah. Uh, and that's the, that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the thing that so many are inclined to do. Um, and so, uh, I, I, when I was president here, I remember students coming and saying, you know, Ruth, I've just had it. I just, I, I can't do it anymore. I am sick and tired of uh, people asking me about my hair and uh, telling me about this and so forth. And I just, I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't, I don't want to have to suffer those indignities anyway, uh, anymore. And so I would say, I have no sympathy for you. <laughs> that is why you're here, okay? People ask you about your hair, tell them. Okay, if they ask you who you are, tell them. The whole point of having you here is so that you can impart to others who you are and so that you won't be a cutout figure for people who know nothing about difference. So, uh, so I think the solution is always to dig deeper into who you are and find ways to appreciate that because what you bring to society and to what you bring to the, uh, uh, the uh, communities that you're a part of is a full understanding of who you are. And there's nothing better than that. Yeah, that's, that's yeah.
Wonderful. So I want to open it up to audience questions. I have one more question that has nothing to do with your book. Okay. And it's, it's not a very serious question. I once heard a story, and you can tell me if it's true. And the story is that when you became president of Smith, your family was like, yeah, that's nice. Brown, yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Prairie View, hometown school. Oh my God. It was amazing. Yeah. Like you would find, right? <laughs> is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it, it was, um, it was quite, well, you should know, Chris, that for all the time I was at Brown and at Smith and at Princeton, they kept saying, what is wrong with you? I thought you had a Harvard PhD and you can't get a job in Texas? <laughs> yeah. And so they wanted me, they wanted me back in Texas, yeah. for sure. <laughs> But then, um, when I was president of the university there, uh, they sort of took over. Uh, and, and again, you know, most of my uh, siblings didn't go to college, and they really know nothing about college. Um, but as soon as I became president of Prairie View, uh, let me tell you, I don't think you made the right decision there. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, you need to do something about um, about the sports uh, situation at Prairie View. Uh, they gave lots of advice. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. Lots of advice about how to. You gotta run. love families. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, about how to run the university, and and they they went to everything. And part of it is that here's a family that has always been um, not really, you know, celebrated, um, and suddenly uh, when they go to football games. Um, the chief of police meets them, and they pr process through the campus <laughs> to the stadium with a police escort. Imagine how that feels yeah. to them. It's right? so lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I keep saying, oh, this is really nonsense. We don't need this. And they say, well, no, no, we want it. <laughs> <laughs> so right, sad. Well, I'm glad. So sad. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to open it up to audience questions. Uh, I have actually two, two ground rules and one request. Uh, one is that, you know, people will be asked to line up behind these two microphones. I would ask that we give students an opportunity to be the first to line up, which would be really nice. And second, given that we do have limited time, please make sure your questions are in fact questions. <laughs> And if they're not, I will cut you off. <laughs> and, and then finally, just it's great if you can just say who you are before you ask a question. So please come on down. And I, I have other questions I can ask if people don't want to. Uh, come on, somebody has to be brave. <laughs> oh my god, OK. I'm so sorry. I also have to be on my tippy toes for this. Um, I'm a little vertically challenged, and I do not want to break the mic and hurt any audience members that are in front of me. But um, hello, my name is Kelly. I am an undergrad studying computer science. I'm also, I guess, in the same position of like first generation college student. So I guess my question is really broad. Do you have any advice for any students just navigating college and just being, I guess, the first in your family to do something when it's really scary and really unknown? Um. Yeah, it, it, is, it is very scary. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, but I do have uh, a particular uh, perspective on this, and I'll, give, uh, I'll answer it with a, with a story. Um, I was a student uh, at Wellesley and um, had my first uh, French course in the language by uh, a professor who was a native speaker. I was utterly lost. Uh, in the course and decided that um, this really was not for me. Um, so I went to the professor and said, I'm very sorry, but I've, I must drop this course. I'm, t I'm completely lost. Um, and he said to my horror, ne vous inquiétez pas. Don't worry. Uh, I said, but I don't understand anything. He said, well, I'm not going to sign your course card. Uh, so I said, what, what should I do? He said, just work harder. Uh, well, I, 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 if I had had enough money to go home, I would have left college that day, believe me. Um, but guess what I did? I went to the language lab and I studied and studied and studied. 
and then kept going to class. And then one day, it dawned on me that I was understanding everything in class. Now, the magic of that moment for me, I cannot convey to you what it meant to me in that moment. To know that I could overcome that uh, enabled me to lose every bit of fear that I had as a student. I was never afraid again, ever. Um, and so I, I, I would say the most important thing is to dig deep, to work as hard as you can, and almost always you discover by doing that and by getting help if you need it, you conquer whatever the problem is that is making you feel that you uh, don't belong. Um, and so I tell that story to my students to remind them that I could have dropped out of school as a consequence of that, uh, and I could have certainly begun to hate French. Instead, I went on to get a PhD in it uh, and to make a career of it. And so that's part of what I'm trying to say in my book is don't permit those moments of doubt um, and sometimes despair to convince you that there isn't a path to doing what you would like to do. Um, and every time I encountered something like that, a path opened up that I could never have anticipated. So just keep doing that and you'll be fine. That's really comforting to hear. Uh, thank you. Uh, for some reason, this microphone is much more popular than that one. <laughs> so I'm going to take two over here and then one, and we'll go, we'll go back and forth like that. So please. Okay. Sounds good. Um, hi again. Hi. I'm Sarah. I'm on student council. Um, so a related question. You know, based on your time at Brown and your knowledge of the university, um, and you know, Brown is ever changing, constantly fluid, always growing. What is something that you hope to see Brown continuing to work on over the next few years, whether it be students advocating for things or administration um, or a collaboration? What, are some, what is the thing that you really want to see Brown working on? Uh, thank you. Um, well, I mean, I think Brown is, is doing it. I, um, let me say that I'm very concerned about state affairs in our country right now. And um, imagine growing up at a time when uh, there was so much division and hatred and violence, um, and now to see that returning to us. Um, I believe that universities remain uh, one of the few spaces in this country that can help to uh, bridge that divide. And so I'd like to see universities play um, a, uh, a role in um, demonstrating the possibility of exchange uh, between people um, and among people of very different views. Uh, among people who um, uh, have, uh, frankly, um, different backgrounds. Uh, so uh, I think Chris's letter uh, following the um, Supreme Court decision um, is uh, very important, and I think for universities to stand tall in this moment will have much more impact than almost anything they've ever done as a, as a sector. So that's what I want to see. I wanted to see the students' voices uh, uh, rise to the challenge. I want to see the university officials uh, rise to the challenge, and I think that um, that 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 is a, the, a singular role for for us because, um, after all, truth is our um, trade, right? Um, and if that is the case, we ought to speak truth in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. Uh, and that can be s scary sometimes, but if enough people do it, it's transformative. As it was in my life when I came along and suddenly there was a movement in this country to end horrific practices that had gone on for a very long time. And it worked. So um, there's a part of us always um, to, you know, we are scholars, and that's fine. 
Uh, there's a part of us, we're friends, we're colleagues, we're family members, but somehow to take all of that and turn it into um, a move to justice is, is one of the most satisfying things that you can do. You know, I, I say all the time, Chris, and I recommend this to you, mm -hmm. that you know, once you're no longer president, you can say just about anything you want to say. Ah, great. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, um, the state of Texas is not very happy with me um, right now um, uh, because, uh, because, because I'm in a position that I can say what I think is the right thing to say. Uh, and that is important for all of us to do because think of all the people on the margins who, ha who, who don't have the capacity to do that. Um, and so those of us who can, must. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my, sorry. Um, hi, hi, I just wanna first thank you so much for being here today. It's such an incredible honor and privilege to hear you speak and just be in the same room as you, so thank you so much. Um, my name is Sydney Stovall. I'm an undergrad here. I study international and public affairs and maybe also French. Um, so, c'est un grand plaisir d'être ici avec vous. Um, but um, it was really amazing and eye-opening um, when you spoke about having students, especially marginalized students, come to you at Brown um, and kind of um, explain to you their, their struggles with being students here and um, your response really struck a chord with me that um, it was specifically your, the example of a student coming to you about um, their difficulty explaining to other students like why their hair looks the way it looks and obviously as a black girl I've gone through that time and time again, we'll continue to go through that. Um, and your response was, explain to them like why yeah. your hair looks like that. Like, like, be a symbol of kind of like like use the platform you have to educate others. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense. But something that I'm thinking of is that for marginalized students, especially, I can speak for myself for black students. Um, it, that can be exhausting to constantly yeah. act um, as a source of information <laughs> while you're being a student. It's impossible to kind of juggle those two sides. Um, so, so I guess. So you want to find out how, what President Simmons thinks about? I'm yeah. just trying to get to the no, question. No, uh, yeah, that's that's yeah. my question. Yeah. Um, what is your advice for students to juggle Thank between you. those two? Yeah. I know that it. I know it can be a challenge to do that, but what students may not realize is how empowering it is when you do it. Um, because um, I've seen people who shrink from that, um, thinking that if they do that, they can just endure it for a short time and then it's over, but it, that's not true. It goes on for the rest of your life. And so uh, taking it on helps you enormously because you never have to bother with people doing it to you again. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, I was very outspoken as a young person and um, what I'm saying is I didn't realize it at the time, but that was enormously empowering to me. And it helped to create the person that I became because I didn't have to suffer in the face of those kinds of assaults. Uh, it was not suffering at all. And in fact, I would even say that today, I deal with lots of different groups and um, the insults can come even when you're 70 years old. So that they don't go away. But what can go away is your power. Uh, what, can't, what cannot go away is your power and your control when you encounter those. And one of the reasons that I think I survived for such a long period of time is I learned to do that as a very young person, as a student, your age. I remember when I was testifying in the Harvard trial, oh, yeah. uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, opposing counsel was um, 
uh, trying to um, uh, trying to um, really um, undermine my testimony, and he brought out a document and he said, "Did you write this?" I said, "Sir, I don't know what it is. I, I'm not sure." He brought it over to me, and I saw it was something I had written many years earlier, many years earlier, um, and I said. Oh, yes, I recognize it. He said, do you still believe this? I said, well, yes, of course. I would say exactly the same today. Um, that is something that you are shaping right now as a student. Who you are, what you think, and how you express yourself, okay? Take some interest in doing that and doing it well, because you're gonna be doing it for the rest of your life, I'm afraid. As are other people who deal with the same kinds of things, but in different forms. Okay, thank you. Please. Thank you so much, President um, Simmons, for your words and insights. Um, I have yet to read your mem I have yet to read your memoir that I just got from Sales Hall, um, but I could already feel um, the really powerful impact of your words. And um, I'm Zoe, by the way, and I'm a first year undergraduate student here. Um, and as someone kind of considering concentrating in English um, or literary arts or ethnic studies, I'm just wondering what the writing process of this memoir has been for you and how you had to contend with these complex emotions that you know, you know, your history would bring up and, um, and I guess more specifically, how you stayed true to your commitment of telling the truth in your memoir. Um, that's uh, very perceptive. Y y your first year? Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was quite hard uh, to do, um, but we are all a work in progress, you know that. Uh, at whatever point we are in our lives, uh, we, we still are becoming someone um, different, perhaps, from who we are at, at that moment. And um, I wanted, more than anything, to be very truthful in this. Because I, I could have, everybody, this is not the book people wanted me to write. Uh, people wanted me to write a tell-all book about my experience in higher education. And they're still waiting for that book, so they don't want, <laughs> they don't want this book. Um, but, uh, but I wanted to be honest about all of the ways that I failed as I was coming along. Um, I wanted to be honest because I wanted my students to understand that you don't have to be perfect at every moment, that you can be perfectly awful. And I described myself as being, having been perfectly awful as a young person um, in the way that I thought about things and the way that I treated people and so forth. Per perfectly awful. Um, but uh, because I had the opportunity to learn and to work out of that, um, I also had the opportunity to be president of Brown. Um, so, so I think what you want to remember is that at any given point, you are undergoing change, if you're, if you're lucky. Um, because if you're paying attention, you're encountering different people, you're learning constantly, then you have to be changing in some way, right? Because you cannot be perfect now, although you seem pretty perfect, but you can't be. <laughs> you can't be. So, um, so there, the, the magic of living is, is um, finding yourself at moments in your life where you surprise yourself. Okay, and you surprise yourself because you had no idea you'd ever be um, uh, able to do something. You had no idea you'd ever be able. I, I find myself being surprised that I can be generous to people who are awful. Uh, and that, that to me is just, I'm so excited about that. Okay, <laughs> I, I am, I am. Um, but, but you, you, know, you, you learn those things over time by giving yourself permission to learn in every sphere, okay? And, um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to please my 
family because I was such a terrible person when I was young, and I'm trying to show them that I'm a better person. And actually, uh, on Monday we had an event and, and my family gave a talk and they actually said I, I was, in fact, a better person. And, <laughs> and nothing pleases me more than that, okay? So, yeah. so, so read, um, delve into um, challenging areas, um, uh, look for ways to learn. And I, I remember the one sign of this for me was when I was uh, 17. I knew there was something wrong about our country in the way that um, people were treated. And I wanted to find out if every place was the same. And so I, I, I escaped. Um, so I got on a Greyhound bus um, when I was 17 to my family's horror and, and went to Mexico to live with a Mexican family at 17 because I knew that I needed to know something about the world and about other people. And uh, try things like that. Do something um, that gives you a different experience from what you're accustomed to. And when you find yourself sinking into a mold where you're, doing, you're feeling very comfortable and you're doing the same thing over and over again, um, then you should be afraid, okay? Because you're probably not going to be growing in the way that you should. So, so can I, yeah, that. <laughs> Look, many of you haven't, she does not come across as awful. You weren't awful. And maybe sometimes a little obnoxious as a child, but not terrible. <laughs> but, but the thing that really struck me was just how brave you were. I mean, the bravery of getting on that bus, doing the things you did, um, getting up on stage and acting. Where did that come from? Was that just you? Or was it influence well, of family uh, members? Or? Well, probably the most important thing that happened to me uh, when I was young is my mother died. Yeah. And I was completely lost mm -hmm. for years, for years. And there was no such thing as grief counseling or no help at all. Uh, but I felt enormous guilt uh, about my mother's death because while she lived, I didn't recognize her for who she was. Mm -hmm. And when it dawned on me that this person had shaped everything about me and that she'd given me the means to live a dignified um, life, I was, I was broken. Um, and so everything that I did from that point on was about trying to live up to what she mm -hmm. taught me. And one of the, the fundamental things she taught me was um, never to see myself as better than another human being, mm -hmm. to respect everyone, everyone, no matter what. Uh, and oh my God, if that hasn't been the central element of my, uh, of my life, I, I, I don't know what is. Uh, and so, so I was lost. I just couldn't figure out what to do. And one of the things that theater did for me is it gave me a place to hide because it has nothing better than acting a part um, in a play that helps you escape reality. Mm -hmm. And I think I say at some point, if I'd found the right character, I could have sunk into that character and never reappeared again. I, I was in such desperate need of becoming someone else because I couldn't deal with the grief mm -hmm. that I was going through. Um, and so, uh, so I, I, but I was pretty awful. And you know, uh, and by the way, I, this it's not just my saying it, but I remember when I became president of Smith, uh, 60 Minutes did a piece on me and Morley Safer came down to Houston to interview my family. <laughs> and, and oh my God, they said, and he, and he asked the dreaded question, what was she like? Uh -huh. And they went on about how horrible I was, okay? <laughs> so I know, I know I was horrible. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you so much for being here. It's really a pleasure. Um, my name is Susan, and I'm a member of the, I think what you call the Greater Brown Community. By some stroke of sheer luck, when I moved to Rhode Island for the first time last year, 
um, and it's, it's a great community to be a part of. Um, I am a lifelong learner and I hope forever curious. And um, so I'm still a student, student forever, and I am, I reflect a lot on my own undergrad and you know, other educational experiences in my career. So I'm fascinated with, number one, young people who you must truly um, exemplify who are focused enough to actually accomplish something in youth. I'm still trying to get there. Um, and the two questions that I have are, how, first of all, how would you describe your friends, the people who were around you when you were young at Brown and different institutions that you were part of um, as you progressed through your career? And very critically, how do you find and cultivate mentors? I think those are two things that I've totally always not been able to do. And I'd like to know how you, how you did that. Thanks. Well, I was, I was lucky after having um, a spate of extraordinary teachers. Um, I was lucky, uh, and after my experience at Wellesley, I was lucky to come to understand that um, mentors weren't always the people that you might expect to be your best mentors. And I often talk about um, a person who was a great mentor to me, uh, Aaron Lemonick at, uh, at Princeton, who um, uh, told me my work was the worst he'd ever seen. And uh, when he said it, he kicked the ca file cabinet to emphasize how disgusted he was with my work. I knew him. You knew him? Yeah, I couldn't imagine that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, but he was a dear man to me because he did something wonderful as a mentor. And that is, he told me the truth. He told me what I needed to know as opposed to what he thought I wanted to hear. And when you're on the margins of society, people um, you know, uh, take certain classes of individuals and they, um, they placate them and they infantilize them. Oh dear, uh, you're doing fine, don't worry. Okay. Um, oh yes. Well, this is this is quite good. Um, uh, and so I say to my students, if you have a professor like that, run far away <laughs> and get to a course where you can have um, a professor who tells you what you need to do to improve. Um, and so my mentors have been people often who have been quite hard on me, but they are precisely the reason that I've had the wonderful career that I've had, because Aaron Lemonick is the person who talked me into becoming a university president. Uh, I had, Smith came to me uh, with an offer and I decided I, I would not take it. Um, and Harold Shapiro, who was president at uh, Princeton at the time, had given me an offer to, to stay at, at Princeton. Um, and I decided, well, I'll stay at Princeton. And Aaron Lemonick took me to lunch and he read the riot act to me. Um, and he said, um, you're being stupid. Um, uh, you don't need to stay at Princeton because Princeton doesn't need you. Uh, if you left tomorrow, they would hardly notice um, that you... <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> what he meant by that was that Princeton, was Princeton is full of capable people. And, and you could be capable here, but if you go on to be president of a college, you're doing something at a different level that is very important and more important than what you would be doing at Princeton. He talked me into that, okay? Um, and he, uh, he's just, I, I don't know, a, a wonderful, he was a wonderful mentor to me. So look for people who have something to offer other than um, I think you're wonderful. Uh, I think that, you know, I think that you uh, don't have to do much more. I hate that kind of talk. And when I, when I encounter it, I, I'm totally um, disgusted by it because, uh, because I, you know in your heart of heart when, uh, when you need to change, when you need to do something better, right? Um, and so when somebody treats you that way, they are treating you as if you're not strong enough to accept 
improvement, uh, suggestions for improvement. Don't let anybody treat you that way. So look for mentors who are strong and who are truthful and who are kind, but who want to help you learn more. Thank you. I think we're here, and then we'll do two there, and then we'll, I think we, we will try to get to everybody who's standing up, okay? So please. Oh, sorry. Hi, Thais Bingham Hickman. I'm the executive director of the Leadership Alliance here. Um, President Paxson said we could ask for advice, so I'm going to ask you for some esteemed advice, if you, if you may. Um, so I myself was a student at one time, an HBCU grad. Um, I went on to get my PhD at uh, NYU, um, went into the private sector for a number of years, and made it to the top of my company and was making a lot of money, but was not happy. Um, and transitioned into academia, and here I find myself uh, managing and leading the Leadership Alliance, of which I was actually a student myself. I was in the program as a student. And so, um, you know, I have the luxury of really building this esteemed organization, taking it to the next level, um, you know, founded here at Brown by our former president, Vartan Gregorian. Obviously, you, through your leadership, helped escalate the program as well. So my question to you is, I listened to you during the Lonnie Grenier and Bell Hooks event, um, and this was before the SCOTUS decision, and you said, you know, the decision was coming down, um, and probably not in our favor, but we've been here before, and now is the time to innovate. And so my question to you is, now that the decision has come down and given where we are, what would you say to leaders like me who are trying to continue to invest in underrepresented students and um, a lot of students are scared, you know, they don't know what to do, they don't want to talk about diversity in their personal statements. Uh, what would you say to our community in light of that decision and how we move forward? It's a very good question. Well, thanks. a good question, but it probably requires um, too, too long an answer, so I'll get, I'll get started. Um, <laughs> One of the things that has troubled me most about the educational sector is the way that we, um, you know, uh, anoint winners um, and um, accuse others of being losers. The thing is that there's something enormously valuable about education wherever it is, because part of it is the practice of focusing on, on learning and uh, discovery, and that can happen um, you know, by the side of the road. Um, it doesn't have to happen in an extravagant uh, new uh, building. Um, and so I think one of the things that we can do is to find a way to collaborate uh, that will not suggest that there are losers in the educational process. Um, students would be a lot happier, industry would be a lot happier, people would be, wouldn't be labeled as much as they are um, today as a consequence of where they went to school, uh, where, they, where they studied and so forth. So I know it's enormously um, enjoyable to be at the top um, and to feel as if you are privileged because you are associated with a particular individual or a particular uh, institution. And that's why I keep going back to other kinds of institutions and saying there is merit to what you're doing here. Keep at it, keep doing it. Um, because there are not enough Browns to accommodate the people who need to learn. There aren't. Um, and so what about those places that are earnestly trying to do that for those whom they serve? Um, we should embrace them. And that's why my project uh, now at Harvard is really to get Harvard to uh, embrace uh, different institutions. Um, and to help them accelerate their capacity uh, for, uh, for research. 
um, enormously important. You know, there's something happening in the way we are beginning to see our institutions. Uh, and we have to be very careful. Uh, you know that uh, we have a leadership crisis in this country. Uh, people don't believe um, the leaders. Um, they, don't, um, uh, they don't aspire uh, to be like them. Um, uh, they uh, really uh, don't know what to do in this uh, period where there aren't people and institutions that they regard as being uh, the kinds of places that they trust. Higher education must not lose the trust of the public, must not. And so in my view, we retain that trust by being the kinds of places that are welcoming, um, that, um, that do not, um, uh, that do not um, create uh, sharp divisions um, among in types of institutions. I, I think in my inaugural address at, at Brown, I, I mentioned that um, Brown should admit more community college students. I think it fell flat at the time, um, but I still believe that. I think uh, all the outreach we can do from these institutions to embrace what other educators are doing uh, in this complex higher education landscape uh, is, will be to the good and we'll be able to garner the respect of the public for playing that role because they are beginning to think that we should be punished for the, for the role we're playing and that's why they're going after legacy admissions. They're going, it, it is, it, 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 there will be a field day against institutions that are privileged because uh, most of the people in the country are not privileged, right? They, they want their chance. And the best way uh, of um, their seeing that chance is for us to make it clear that we value what those institutions are doing and that we are interested in assisting um, them in um, elevating what they can bring to their own students. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Aya. Um, I'm a uh, Brown grad, uh, class of 2013. Um, so I had the uh, pleasure and the honor of being a student under your presidency as well as um, under uh, President Paxson. Um, I'm also on the Brown University Community Council under uh, Paxson's leadership. Um, and uh, first, I wanted to just thank you. Um, thank you not just for this conversation, but thank you for your example. Um, as you've talked about your family and your upbringing, I'm the middle child of a uh, five-kid household raised by a single dad in Boston, um, grew up low income. So the power of your story really speaks to me. I was the first of my siblings to, to graduate from college. Um, to this day, I'm the only bachelor degree holder in my, uh, of my siblings. And absolutely, much like your story, educators played such a critical role in inspiring and guiding and getting me to where I am. Um, black women educators um, are why I am here today. Um, and coming to Brown, seeing you, having you as our president, the first African-American president of an Ivy League institution, was the example and inspiration I needed um, and continues to inspire me today. Um, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> and my question. Um, <laughs> so I'm a brown guy. You were almost at the time, I got but you. I didn't do it. I got it. you. I got you. <laughs> I'm a brown guy, but I'm also a millennial, so I'm very, very idealistic. Uh, and so your leadership throughout has shown the moral complexity, um, the way you've navigated being at a place like Brown, having its history with slavery, its history with injustice, and having the center that you've built here and ensuring that your legacy addressed that. I think as a millennial and an idealist, and an anti-capitalist with a business degree. Um, I'm confused. So what's, I think it, so what's the question? The question is, yeah. 
given my confusion, and maybe this generation's confusion, how, what's your theory of change? How did you navigate saying, we're gonna raise Brown's endowment, and we're gonna make Brown a corporation, and we're gonna navigate these aspects of what people may critique me for, but I'm also going to show that we care about this history, and we care about marginalized groups, and we care about community. And throughout your journey, you've balanced this in a way that I really need guidance. <laughs> um, how did, what's your theory of change? How have you built it, and how, if and how it's changed over time to allow you to have the impact that well, you've had? Well, I'll try to do this um, briefly, but uh, to me, um, everybody worries about, uh, about change in other people. Um, uh, but in, for me, um, the, the, the secret is um, working on yourself first. Um, people will not be confused, and you won't be confused, if you come to a point where you understand what uh, is meaningful to you and how far you will go in order to um, accomplish the things that you want to accomplish. And what was lucky for me is by the time I got to Brown, I knew absolutely what I was willing to do and what I was not willing to do. I knew absolutely what was a value to me and what was not a value to me. Um, and, um, and so it was not a problem for me to take the mission of this university uh, particularly its progressive mission, and to understand how to um, not only explicate that more fully, uh, but also to enrich it. Uh, because if you want to have the standing as the, pro the um, progressive uh, institution, uh, you, you have to be progressive. Um, and, so, and so the test of that is always uh, looking at yourself. Okay, uh, and so here's what people don't buy. They don't buy your saying one thing and doing another. Uh, they don't buy your uh, standing up for uh, truth and you, you are lying. Uh, they don't buy uh, the fact that you are upholding certain things that are not um, uh, worth very much and decrying things that are worth everything. Okay, they don't buy that. So um, there has to be some kind of coherence to who you are. Uh, and if you have that, you know, I was given so much bad advice along the way that I rejected. Um, I'll give you some examples of the kind of bad advice I was given. Uh, first, um, I was told, uh, I, just, I was asked to direct the Afro-American Studies uh, program at, at Princeton, and everybody told me that was a career-ending mistake if I did it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I could have bought that, but I didn't, okay? Um, and so I, I directed Afro-American Studies and, you know, to get it on its feet and to start its, its progress. Um, uh, and what happened as a consequence of that? Uh, I didn't know anything about Afro-American Studies because I, I, I did French, right? <laughs> so, but here's what I did know. I knew that there was value in having in the academy the serious study of African-American life and history and culture. I knew that. And I accepted it ultimately because I knew I would be the person who cared most about representing that to the community at Princeton and then following up on it. Um, and so, so knowing who you are, I knew that about myself. I knew that I didn't have any business directing Afro-American studies because I knew nothing about it but I also knew that I cared about it, and I cared about its standing, and so that's why I did it. I was told when I, I left Princeton to go to Spelman because I thought, well, it would be wonderful to go to an HBCU and to try to help an HBCU. So I left Princeton, oh my God. People at Princeton said, oh, that's a career-ending decision. <laughs> if you go to Spelman from Princeton, you'll never be able to um, recover from that mistake. That, that's what they said, okay? But I knew who I was, 
And I said, this is something that's important to do. I think I can do it and I will do it. And of course, Princeton came and, and, and uh, talked me into coming back, uh, back to Princeton. Um, and so at every turn, and then when I, oh my goodness, I left Brown and I retired. And then what did I do? I decided to become president of an HBCU and people had a fit. Are you kidding me? You have been president of Brown, um, Ivy League, and you're gonna go be president of an HBCU? Oh my God. You know, this is the end. All right. Um, when I when I uh, decided that we should tell the truth about slavery, um, you know, the 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 people who were most upset about it were black people, uh, because they said, well, you know, you're you're president of Brown, and you're going to do something, uh, and you're going to make it very hard for um, for African Americans because you're doing this controversial thing, right? Um, so. If you are not grounded in who you are, you will be pulled in lots of different directions. So work on that first, okay? Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Aya. Let's go over here, please. Um, uh, hello, uh, my name is Wujira Balogun. I am a senior at Classical High School, and I... <laughs> I'm also the co-chair on our board of directors at Young Voices. Shout out to Young Voices. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I have two questions for you, if, if you don't mind. Um, my first question is kind of like, I'm gonna start with on the path that I'm on. Uh, myself, I'm on a path to, you know, creating change by like, one smile at a time. And in that moment that I'm trying to create all this change, I really get stuck on the question about, you know, who am I as a person, you know? Because everybody has um, a perception of who you are, you know? How did you go about, you know, finding out that, oh, this is who I am, this is what I'm going to stick with, and this is what people will know me for because I did that. Th that's the question. Um, well, I, you know, I was not trying to become someone to be known for a certain thing. Um, uh, and first of all, let me say that the self-knowledge comes after a lot of work and it comes over a period of time. You don't wake up one day and discover, oh, well, this is who I am, right? So. Um, Thankfully, um, you know, you're, you're a student and you have the ability to um, learn a lot, to read uh, widely, um, to observe um, uh, other people um, and the way they create a life. Uh, you have the opportunity to get to know people who are very different from you. Um, all of that together helps you arrive at a place where you come to know um, uh, who, who you are. I, I was very much influenced by a 16th century philosopher. <laughs> that sounds silly, I know, but um, uh, who wrote uh, wonderful um, uh, pieces that uh, were um, meant to reflect on everything that he experienced. And by reading um, his essays, I came to think, okay, well here, here is a process for self-reflection and self-criticism. Um, and I learned to try to do the best I could to imitate, imitate that process. Um, and it was very helpful to me. Um, question yourself, uh, why did I do that? What was that all about? Um, uh, should I do this or should I do that? Um, what, is the, what is the context for what you're doing? Um, if you don't have a reason for what you're doing, that's a good indication that probably, um, uh, you know, the, the, that, that it's not anchored in, uh, in uh, reason. It's not anchored in uh, some um, um, motive that you have. So, um, so, you know, I may be, do, I may do this in the extreme, reflecting on 
what I'm doing. And I, I, I did that as a young person. I do it even today. So when George, uh, George Floyd um, uh, occurred, uh, I, was, I was very um, moved. And I knew my students were even more upset than I. I wanted to say something to them. Um, but I didn't want, I didn't know what to say. Very much like when I was here and 9-11 occurred and being president at those moments, it's very difficult to know what to say because you know your role is first of all to comfort uh, students and to give them something to hold on to. And so, but I, when, at moments like that, I always turn to what I feel um, and I want my students to see what I'm feeling. And that's the way I relate to them. So what I did was to think about what I felt should be done in that moment. And I wrote a letter to um, the students telling them how I was feeling and what I thought we should be doing as a consequence of that. That was that's my, way, my way of doing it. So um, you will develop uh, ways of uh, coping in moments like that, uh, but when you do cope in moments like that, you'll begin to understand who you are. Uh, on 9-11, uh, we, um, there was some discussion of canceling uh, classes, and I said no, immediately, no. Um, we must not cancel classes, because I didn't want the students going back to their rooms uh, in that moment, and so we met on the green instead. Um, so. A lot of it is instinct based on uh, the way you cope, uh, on the experiences you've had, and that's why it's so meaningful to have a variety of experiences because you can relate to people better if you have had a variety of experiences. So good luck to you. Keep smiling. <laughs> thank you. Um, President Simmons, thank you so much for coming. Um, as you know, I was an undergraduate here many moons ago, and it meant so much to me that you would take time to talk to students like me who would ask about their hair and all other sorts of things as an undergraduate trying to navigate the space here. And so now I am an Associate Dean um, of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here in the School of Engineering. Um, <laughs> And I just started a month ago, so it's, it's um, very surreal to be here and, and such a true honor uh, to have had you as our president and now uh, President Christina Paxson. Um, and as you know, um, my, my story is uh, similar, like the background of my parents. So my grandmother was also a sharecropper um, and she only had maybe a seventh grade education and now to be here is just, you know, <laughs> the whole story, maybe I'll write a book one day too, right, you can maybe <laughs> give me some tips on that. But um, I know that you helped to start the engineering uh, uh, program at Smith College and that was just such an inspiration to me, especially now that I'm you know, here in engineering and is an, I'm an engineer myself. Um, and I just wanna know uh, from that experience, what did you learn about developing a school of engineering? What sort of advice would you give to me as a new associate dean? Um, just things that you wish you knew during that period. Wow. Um, well, you know, I, um, I had the conviction that uh, at that time, women um, really had a struggle uh, in engineering. And uh, I wanted to um, uh, make it possible for uh, Smith students to get a good start um, in engineering and have the um, confidence that they would need uh, in a profession where they were often seen as less than. Um, and so, uh, so that's really the reason that I started it. And, um, and I'm really uh, pleased that uh, we started it and it worked out uh, so well. But there was, there was considerable opposition to it, of course, because um, the question was, well, you know, we're a liberal arts college. We don't do that here. And look out for people saying we don't do that sort of thing, okay. Um, and, and so uh, it's well ensconced uh, there uh, now. Of course, I love it because when I go to Smith, the engineering students always line up and hug me. Uh, <laughs> they're so happy uh, that they're, they're in that program. Um, I think the only thing to remember is that engineering is, um, is a challenging uh, profession still. Um, and it's challenging for many different groups. Um, I, I know this because I'm often asked to speak to uh, engineering companies 
and when I go in and I talk to them, I hear the experiences they are having. Um, and it still can be very, very um, much a struggle, especially to advance within engineering fields. So I think what you want to do is to remember that it's not just a profession, that it's all about who the people are. So you have to, you, you, you have to help students understand they must develop themselves uh, in order to be uh, ready for the profession that they want to, um, that, that they want to uh, practice. Uh, and that's true of any profession. It could be true of law, it could be tr true of medicine. Um, we often think that, or young people often think that as long as they take certain courses and they get certain things done, well, that's it. That's all they have to do. It's not true, okay? Because you are a person first, and how you operate in that sphere is all important. So you can be a brilliant engineer and get into a profession and have no success if you don't have the personal wherewithal to do the job. So. Universities like Brown help create the whole person, okay? So make sure that taking full advantage, especially in engineering, taking, take full advantage of that because it's just as important for them to be whole human beings um, doing engineering as to be um, engineers um, who uh, maybe are incomplete uh, human beings. Wonderful, thank you. So I, I, I promised you something that I'm going to have to take back. We're nearing the end of our time, and I think we only have time for one more question, and then I have a final question for you. So uh, how, how about this? You asked your question, you asked your question, she can do them both. But quick, please. Um, OK, hi, I'm a senior. My name is Demi, sorry. And I'm a senior at Classical. Um, and I spent um, every Friday of the second semester of my junior year at the newly named Ruth J. Simmons Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Oh. So um, I wanted to thank you for the work that you've been doing because without that work, I wouldn't have been able to do um, the work I did at TSSJ. Um, and the question I had for you is, um, how did you deal with the backlash you experienced um, in creating the Slavery and Justice Report? And what was the most surprising or interesting thing you learned through that process? Thank okay. you. And one more. And see how you put these together. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, my name is Jared Webb. I'm from Montgomery, Alabama. I'm a first year graduate student in health equity scholarship study in public health here at Brown University. And I also went to Dillard University in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, my question to you is, um, how did your HBCU experience at Dillard help you navigate spaces like Brown and Princeton and Harvard? Because it's, it's, to me, it's still a cultural shift and culture shock that I'm here at Brown University from Dillard University. And, um, also, as an alum, what could be some advice to give back to my HBCU in meaningful ways? Thank you. Um, Thank you. Well, first, let me say money is meaningful. Uh, that's the first thing you do, okay? Give and give every year. That's, that's important. Uh, so I'm gonna try to answer both. Um, it was difficult uh, when we announced um, the Slavery and Justice Initiative uh, here. Uh, there's no question about that. And I, as I say, um, uh, a lot of random um, uh, comments and advice uh, to me. Uh, that, was, that was the moment that I first had a, an officer stationed outside my house because people from all over the country were interested in, in this and, um, and, and seemed threatened by it. Um, and so, um, really, um, the only thing that I could do at the time, I knew it was a perilous moment, I knew that, but the only thing I could do at the time is to continue to elevate people's perspective. Because the thing is that we are often drawn down to the lowest common denominator in our interactions. And people wanted to make it something that it was not. And so our task was to keep them focused on the, um, uh, what we had defined as the reason for this, okay? 
Um, and so telling the truth was the reason. Um, people ask us what the history was. We were not prepared to lie about it, and so we were committed to telling the truth. It's just that simple. So sometimes the uh, answer is really uh, in its simplest and purest form. Um, and since universities are about truth, um, it's unassailable logic to say universities tell the truth. They're about the facts, okay? Unassailable. And so we stuck to that. And um, eventually, uh, people came to see from the artifacts that were being shown, from the way we conducted it, that we were not on a witch hunt, that we were not, um, uh, you know, um, it had nothing to do uh, really with trying to make people feel bad, um, that we were, we had a higher calling in a sense. Um, and eventually people came to see that. But the most important thing, I think, because of the way it spread, is that we persisted in the face of all of the negative um, reactions that we got. Um, and just that fact that we believed so deeply in what we were doing, um, that we persisted with it, with the support of the university. Um, it was not controversial as much as one would have thought within the university because we had a corporation um, that um, allowed this to go forward. Um, we had a campus um, that uh, continued to support the, um, the idea of it, even without knowing how it was going to, going to turn out. We had members of the Brown family still connected to the university that we were talking to all the time, okay? So this is the thing that people need to realize about the racial divisions in this country. In spite of it, you can continue to talk to people who are on the other side of the other side of the fence. And um, I worked hard to convince the Browns that this is about really telling the truth about the history. It wasn't about them um, and um, denigrating them in any way. Okay, the the modern Brown family. Um, that was very very important to do that. Um, and I often advise universities today that are trying to do this to stay away from that poisonous uh, area of um, castigating. We, we all know slavery was horrible, okay? We all know that. We all know that it was, it was based in, um, in a, 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 a perception of the inferiority of uh, blacks. We know that, okay? So, but what are we going to do now is the question. And how can we live together and cooperate together now? That's the question. So, um, so that, that helped immensely. In terms of HBCUs um, and being, you know, Dillard, I often say that if I hadn't gone to Dillard, I probably couldn't have survived Harvard. Um, uh, HBCUs have the capacity to help um, African Americans stand taller because you're not facing the constant um, assaults that um, you face in other parts of society. Um, and so uh, as a consequence, uh, and there's another thing that happens at HBCUs that often students don't get in other universities and that is people tell you the truth. And you know, I, uh, I treat my students at Prairie View horribly. I mean, they, they come up and they say silly things to me. I tell them they're being silly. Um, or they do something inappropriate and I tell them, you know, it's wholly inappropriate. Or they ask me to do something and I say, I'm not going to do that because that's a stupid idea. Um, so, so the other th benefit of it is that you are shaped in an environment in which people tell you the truth about what you're doing and what you're not doing, right? And so often students who are not in such an environment get infantilized um, by people who are well-meaning who want to make them feel good. But they don't grow as much as a consequence and therefore when they encounter difficulties later, it's very hard for them because they haven't had 
that kind of um, messaging uh, before. So when I went to, um, when I went to, ended up going to Harvard, it was, it was a very difficult period uh, for me at Harvard because I was the only African American student in my, uh, in my degree program. And, and they didn't know what I was doing there because I was black studying French, and that seemed so anomalous to everybody for some reason. Um, and so, but I, but I thought, yeah, you know, you may not think that, um, you know, I belong here, but I'm certainly the smartest person here. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so, so that feeling didn't, wasn't created at Harvard. I brought that to Harvard from Dillard because I was that self-confident about what I could do at that point. And that's the, re that's a, that's the real value, I think, of it. So therefore, um, you know, you need to be giving very heavily to Dillard for what they <laughs> did for you. Do you want to say anything about giving heavily to Brown before you could? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> That too. Yeah. Uh, so I want to thank you. We're at the end of our time. Uh, just really great to have you here. I am great looking forward back. to seeing your Jefferson lecture. I'll be in Washington. I'm sure it will be published and people will be interested in hearing oh, that Oh, thank too. you so much, Chris. You're doing a great job. It's thank a you. pleasure to be back and to see how the place is thriving. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all.